Hello, I am excited to share with you some of the results from our recently published study looking how what we eat before exercise influences that exercise session. This study is one part of my PhD that is looking at this basic but super important question of what should I eat before exercise. Now, to give some brief background on this, we know that adaptations to exercise are the result of accumulated signaling that happens during the exercise session. So what that means is exercising once is good, but of course it takes multiple repeated consistent efforts to actually get fitter, faster, or stronger. We also know that what we eat before, during, and after exercise influences that exercise session. Of course, athletes have many choices when it comes to what they could or should be eating around exercise. And the thing that's so exciting about this research is that the effects of these nutrition choices on the longer term training adaptations are quite unclear. So I'm going to take you into our lab for the next few minutes to show you some of the things we looked at and what we found. One thing that surprised me before we actually ran this study was the wildly divergent views that people have when it comes to what they should be eating before exercise. And we performed a survey looking at what people are actually eating before exercise and it was filled out by nearly 2,000 endurance athletes from 57 different countries. And some of the key things we found were that nearly two thirds of endurance athletes perform some type of fasted training. Males performed it more than females. People on a low carb, high fat diet did fasted training more than others. And pro athletes did less fasted training than others. And in addition to that, we found that many people actually think fasted training is beneficial and many people think it's actually harmful. There's a few questions we asked that really highlight this. And one being the quality of my workout is the same whether I eat or don't beforehand. And around half the people disagreed and a quarter of people agreed. We also asked if skipping breakfast will allow me to burn more fat during my workout. And again, there's actually quite a, a variety of responses. And this is something that's quite testable. And that's what we we're gonna look at in this next study. If you're curious about reading more about the surveys, it was published in two papers shown here, and I'll include the links for those as well. If you wanna read the full text, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to send you a PDF. So what we did, we performed an acute crossover study. So there's three treatments, which each person went through all three. One time they performed a workout in the fasted state, so having just water. One time following a protein rich breakfast and we used a scoop of whey protein and some peanut butter and another time following a carbohydrate rich breakfast. So that was some sports drink with some bread and jam. In this study, we have 17 well-trained male cyclists. If you're familiar with these numbers, this is a really solid group of cyclists. VO2 max of 62 and peak power, that's quite high. Um, these people are, are not pros, but certainly training you know, uh, on average 14 hours a week. So they're quite well-trained. This is what the workout looked like. So we split it into two halves. Essentially we have on the left, we see four by five minutes, and that's submaximal kind of continuous cycling. The VTs stand for ventilatory threshold, so VT100 is 100% 100 of the power at the ventilatory threshold. VT60 and 80 is 16, 80% of that, and delta 20 is 20% of the difference between the VT and peak power. So more simply, this goes from pretty easy to a little bit hard during this stage. Then they had a short couple minute break, and then they performed six by three minute intervals with three minutes between intervals. The first three were preset at a wattage that was hard but doable, and the last three were all out efforts. Let's first focus on the submaximal portion of this workout. And we measured fat oxidation. So again, remember we have three treatments and we have four different exercise intensities. And we can see here the fat oxidation in grams per minute. In this lowest intensity, we see differences between the carbohydrate group, which is in red, and the fasted and the protein groups, which are in green and blue. There was no difference uh, from a statistical standpoint between the fasted and protein, but they were both higher than the carbohydrate group. Now, of course, that's not super surprising. We'd expect fat oxidation to be higher in the fasted state than if you've had a carbohydrate rich breakfast, but what's been far less studied is the effects of protein. And so protein, which some people might think would reduce fat oxidation because it causes an insulin response, it actually doesn't um, to a large degree. And we're not the first people to have shown this, but there's uh, far fewer studies looking at pre-exercise protein. So as we continue on the intensities, the same pattern holds true, although the differences between groups diminish a bit. As you can see, as the intensity increases, generally fat oxidation rates decrease. And what we can say is in terms of fat oxidation, fasted state has the highest. Protein is similar to fasted, though slightly less, and both of them are far greater than carbohydrate. We also measured how hard it was for the athletes to perform these. RPE is rating of perceived exertion, and that's on a scale between six and 20. 
you can see here there is no difference in how hard the workout felt between the different treatments. So these are, the, again, the four different intensities, and we see that it goes from about a 8 or 9 out of 20 up until about a 13 or 14 out of 20, but no differences between groups. Now, so far, this has not been super surprising. We know that you're going to burn more fat in the fasted state, and the perceived exertion at low intensity, I didn't expect to be that different. But what I was most curious about was how the interval training was going to be. So remember, the first three intervals were preset, but the last three were all-out efforts, and we wanted to see how much power someone could put out. And so what, what this is going to show is the average power during those last three intervals. Many people think that carbs will help performance in interval training, but what we found was there's actually no differences. We see the dotted lines are the individual responses, and the, the solid lines are the average group responses. And we see that they're essentially identical, which was really quite surprising to me. Also, if you're familiar with numbers and power outputs, you'll see that some of these guys in the 400 plus watts range on average for three by three minute intervals is a really, again, a solid group of cyclists. We also measured perceived exertion during the interval training. And again, we have these three treatment groups and there's no differences between the groups. So these ratings went from about a 16 out of 20 to a 20 out of 20. And it didn't matter if someone ate or not ate beforehand, it all felt about equally hard. When we think about some of the reasons given in the survey for why people do fasted training or why they avoid it, the biggest reasons people do perform fasted training is to increase fat oxidation and because of gut comfort. And the reasons they avoid it are because they feel like they'll feel terrible or they'll get too hungry. So what this study has shown that at least in terms of fat oxidation, yep, that's, that checks out that you will burn more fat in the fasted state. Although of course protein is a, I think an underappreciated option. But as far as feeling terrible and not performing as well, well, at least that's not what we found. Now, what about gut comfort and hunger? Those are reasonable questions, so we also looked at that in this study. So hunger was measured using a visual analog scale, or VAS. Imagine a scale on a piece of paper asking the question, how hungry are you? On the left, it'll say, not hungry at all, and on the right, it'll say extremely hungry, and so it's a quantifiable way to measure hunger. And at the beginning, when people came into the lab, there was no differences in hunger. Everyone was around a 50 out of 100. And after exercise, Hunger decreased to around 25 out of 100, but importantly, there was no differences between groups. Now, gut discomfort, there was a difference. It was generally low for everyone throughout, but the protein group did have a slight increase, and that was largely from two or three people that maybe had some, some stomach issues. So on the scale of 0 to 100, it's still not that high, but there is a possibility for protein to cause a little bit of gut discomfort. So back to this initial question of what should I eat for exercise? Well. In the context of a roughly one hour workout where you might be doing some interval training, what we can say is to increase fat oxidation, you can do it in the fasted state or with protein. As far as performance, it doesn't seem to matter. Perceived effort doesn't seem to matter. Gut comfort, you might be better off skipping the protein and either doing it fasted or with carbohydrate. And in terms of hunger, it also shouldn't seem to matter. Now, again, I wanna stress that the results are most applicable and essentially only applicable to workouts less than around 75 to 90 minutes at the, at the most. If you work out longer than that, we'd certainly expect to see some performance differences in terms of uh, fasted training being probably not as good, but we purposely set this workout up to be similar to what people might do on a weekday, where you're doing 20 minutes of warm-up or so and letting it rip for some intervals. Now, this doesn't give us any information on how it influences the longer-term adaptations to training. It's possible that in the fasted state or with protein, there might be a greater stimulus, which causes a greater adaptation over time, or maybe not. And that's part of the current study we're looking at, doing three weeks of low intensity training with only one of these three groups, meaning someone is either always gonna have carbohydrate before their endurance training sessions, or protein, or do them in the fasted state. And we also have two interval training sessions a week that are fed a standardized breakfast. So I'm really excited to share that with you, and I certainly will make another video when the results are ready. I'm happy to answer any questions about this. You can certainly reach out via email or on Twitter.